Hey, I see you, Mom. I see you waiting in the car line. I see you waking up early. Going the extra mile. Doing those little things you seldom get credit for. Yeah, I see you. I see you working the job. Running the errands. And cooking those meals. Or at least ordering the takeout. Oh, I see you. I even see what most of the world misses. The prayers, the thoughts. The quantum tasking. The working the job while planning the whole day. The whole week ahead. Only a mom could do this. Actively completing one task while the next four tasks are simultaneously being sorted out. I see you scoffing at the phrase, out of sight, out of mind. Knowing that phrase was definitely coined by a dad because that's not how moms do it. We don't get the gift of out of mind because who else would think about these things? Who else is gonna worry if she's eating her veggies at school? Or how his friends treat him? Or how he treats his friends? Or if the permission slip was signed? Or if this F will be the straw that breaks the college scholarships back? Or if his future spouse is gonna judge you for his dental hygiene? Or if... If you're giving your kids a good view of God. Or a bad view of God. Or view of God at all. You mean the God who created life? Who not only knows every hair on your head, but also knows what you're gonna ask before you even speak a word. A loving parent who intimately knows their children. Sounds an awful lot like a mom, don't you think? I'd say you're a beautiful reflection of God's love. And maybe this is exactly the way you show God to your kids. These thoughts don't distract us from the job. It's what makes us awesome at it. Yeah. I see you, Mom. I see you. And God, God sees you. Good morning and welcome everyone to this service on this wonderful, incredible, fantastic Mother's Day. To all of the mothers in the house and to the mothers that's watching us via all the various streaming devices, we welcome you, we thank God for you. We pray that God will continue to bless you, God continue to increase you, and fulfill you in every way in the name of Jesus. Our vision here at WorkFine is uh, building strong families and uh, serving global communities. And so in that sense, I just want to say a quick prayer for mothers this morning. I want to thank God that uh, all, of our, all of our mothers are blessed with every spiritual blessings in Christ Jesus. We want to thank God that our mothers recognize that God has uniquely placed within them everything they need in order to nurture, to teach, to comfort, to create a heaven for their children. And I pray this morning that every mother will be filled with the love, the peace, the endurance, the kindness, the strength and joy of the living God in the name of Jesus, that God will continue to empower our mothers to rely and to call upon God in their time of needs. And for those who are yearning to be mothers, those who have never had a mother figure, those who have lost their mother, mothers who have lost children, and to those who love children who are not their own, I pray that God will overwhelm you by his sweet presence today and forever in the name of Jesus. We also pray for mothers in the unrich parts of the world. Those who do not even recognize, do not know the nature of their calling, that God has already called them and empowered them to nurture, to, cre to create, to, 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 to be a blessing. I pray God in Jesus' name that God will send a messenger that will carry the message of God in the name of Jesus to encourage them and so that the favor of God can be upon all mothers for a thousand generations in the name of Jesus, we pray. And everybody said? Amen. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Also, let me just jump quickly into the message this morning. And I'm going to be speaking from Proverbs chapter 31. Let me just read the very familiar Mother's Day scripture. <laughs> if you've ever been to a Mother's Day service, you've probably heard this scripture read already. Proverbs 31. I'm going to start from verse 10. And this morning... I'm going to speak using the title, Woman of Virtue. Woman of Virtue. Proverbs 31, verse 10. Who can find a virtuous wife? For her worth is far above rubies. The heart of her husband safely trusts her, so we have no lack 
of gain. She does him good and not evil all the days of her life. She seeks wool and flax and willingly works with her hands. She's like the merchant ships. She brings her food from afar. She also rises while it is yet night and provides food for her household and a portion for her maid servants. She considers a field and buys it. From her profits, she plants a vineyard. She girds herself with strength and strengthens her arms. She perceives that her merchandise is good and her lamp does not go out by night. She stretches out her hands to the distaff and her hand holds the spindle. She extends her hand to the poor. Yes, she reaches her out her hands to the needy. She's not afraid of snow for her household, for her household is clothed with scarlet. She makes tapestry for herself. Her clothing is fine linen and purple. Her husband is known in the gates when he sits among the elders of the land. She makes linen garments and sells them and supplies wash and searches for the merchants. Strength and honor are her clothing. She shall rejoice in time to come. She opens her mouth with wisdom and on her tongue is the law of kindness. She watches over her ways she watches over the ways of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children rise up and call her blessed, her husband also, and he praises her. Many daughters have done well, but you excel them all. And I want to say that on behalf of all the women at work fine. Many daughters have done well, but you exceed them all. All in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. <laughs> Praise God. Give me verse 30 and 31, and then we can dive into the message. Charm is deceitful and beauty is passing. <laughs> but a woman who fears the Lord, she shall be praised. Verse 31, give her of the fruit of her hands and let her own works praise her in the gardens. Amen. Hallelujah. And again, we want to thank you for all the women in the house, all the mothers and mothers-to-be. We thank God for all of you. And in particular, if you just allow me a little bit, I want to thank God for my wife. Praise God. Amen. As I do for all the other mothers in the house as well. So this morning, I want to speak on virtue, on the women of virtue. First of all, that word virtue. That is one of the few words in all of the English vocabulary that carries many, many, many meanings. First, it means noble character. It means one who is worthy. It means courageous person or woman. It means very good woman. It means a respected woman or person. It means woman of excellence. It means a person of bravery. And lastly, it means a capable person. Now, all of these definitions I just gave you, or meanings I just gave you, are all found in the, as the various translations translate that word virtue. Okay? So that gives you the scope of what it means when you say a person is a virtuous person, a virtuous woman. Now, three things about the passage I just read. Three things. Number one, it was a poem of the definition of wisdom gleaned from Proverbs chapter 8 and chapter 9. Proverbs 8 and 9 define wisdom, and from that definition, we read Proverbs 31 verses 10 to 31. Secondly, these particular Proverbs was written to men in particular. In fact, if you look in Proverbs 31, verse 1, give that to me very quickly, please. Verse 1 of Proverbs, thank you. The Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel, verse 2. No, no, no. Proverbs 31, verse 1. 
Thank you very much. I guess it's my accent. Glory to God. <laughs> I need to start speaking American now. <laughs> Will you please give me Proverbs 31 verse 1? <laughs> Glory to God. <laughs> the words of King Lemuel, the utterance which his mother, what, taught him. So right there, you see the confirmation. This passage was written to men. And in the Orthodox Jewish home, they sang this passage to mothers, wives, and daughters on Sabbath. Now, it is important that you understand that these men sang this to encourage their wives, their mothers, and their daughters because of the roles those people play in the nurturing of the family. Now, they did not sing this song to point fingers on what they needed to do. I need to say that again. They were not pointing fingers and say, okay, woman, you need to do this. You need to be industrious. You need to be kind. You need to be good. Da, da, da. No, no. They were singing this passage to extol, to admire them for what they already do. So all the men in the house today, and those of you listening and watching, you should not use this occasion to command or demand. You should use this occasion to extol, to affirm, to encourage, and to appreciate everything that the mothers and the wives and the daughters do for us. Amen? So it's a joyful celebration of all women. Let me say that again. You see, because this passage is not saying that every single woman as an entity must fulfill everything that this passage said. No. Because none of us of ourselves are complete. You may be able to do two or three things very well. We thank God for that. Another lady or woman or daughter or wife may be able to do two or three things, and we thank God for that. So what this passage is doing is looking at a collage of all women and celebrating all women collectively to say, yes, thank God for the women in all of our lives. So it is a celebration of all women not a job description for any woman. Amen. Did you hear that? <laughs> it was a song that was sung in appreciation, not a sermon on expectations. Amen? And then thirdly, thirdly, three things. I'll give you the first two. Thirdly, we focus on the word virtuous. A virtuous woman. It means a woman of valor, a woman who is brave. Recently, not too long ago, a couple of months ago, Angela Merkel, the former, the former chancellor of Germany, resigned. She stepped down. She was elected to lead Germans of about 80 million population, and she led them for 18 years with competence, skill, dedication, and sincerity. Now, if you know anything about Germans, what I'm about to say should strike you. Uh, for, because for a long time, uh, I used to fly Lufthansa, the German carrier. And they were known for their incredible efficiency. When you get on Lufthansa, and they tell you the flight is going to be 9 hours and 15 and a half minutes, you can be rest assured it will not be nine hours and 16 minutes. That's how incredibly efficient they were. So I used to flood them a lot, back and forth in those days. But one thing they lacked that was so obvious, you will not get all the pleasantries, the greeting and the warmth and say, you are welcome, this is wonderful, we're looking forward to serve you. You can forget that. If you are looking for warmth and, and jovial, uh, being jovial, and you, Lufthansa is not your airline. Now, I'm saying that to say, 
when Angela Merkel resigned, when she said, look, you know what, I'm stepping down, when she made the announcement, all of Germany, the Germans, went to the balcony of their houses and clapped and gave an applause for six minutes spontaneously, nonstop. Oh, you guys didn't hear what I just said. It was not planned. It was not choreographed. It was not scripted spontaneously. Why? Because this woman had demonstrated for them virtue. And therefore, when she stepped down, all of Germany went outside on their balconies. Do you know how long six minutes is to clap? Try it someday. <laughs> it's like eternity. Amen? So I'm showing you how being virtuous can be so impacting so much so a whole nation came out and began to applaud this woman. Amen? Now let's go to the scriptures in Ruth chapter 3. Ruth chapter 3. In verse 11. Hopefully my accent should not... Uh... Aha! Okay. It's on there. Ruth chapter 3, verse 11. And now, my daughter, do not fear. I will do for you all that you request for all the people of my town know that you are a virtuous woman. Now, isn't that amazing? It, it, what amazed me here is not the issue of how virtuous Ruth was, in, although she was very virtuous. But what I'm, what I'm seeing in this verse is the impact of her uh, uh, virtuousness, so much so, Boaz said, all the people of my town can uh, testify to it. It's, it's important for us to recognize we live in such a close-knit community that the impact of my life or your life can be felt so significantly until everybody just knows it. You go to Hollywood on a tour, or, or you, you go to Los Angeles and you go to, on a tour of Hollywood. This guy will tell you this is the house of uh, Al Pacino. This is the house of Madonna. This, how do they know that? When those guys are buying a house, they, they, they announce it and say, okay, you know, I'm going to give it to a tour guide so they can show my house to everybody that comes around. No. But the point I'm making is that it's amazing how who we are affects things around us. Yeah. So here in this story, Ruth... And I really don't want to go into all the details. She was called a woman of virtue by a man who had it all together, Boaz, who is a type of Jesus, a kinsman redeemer. Now, you must recognize that while Ruth was standing before Boaz, who made this declaration on her, she was a desperate, penniless destitute foreigner because she was a Moabite. She came from Moab, an enemy of Israel, that today in contemporary times may have been considered one of those nations that was mentioned in, in previous uh, years ago. You know that S nations that was, you know, those, those nations? That, that, that's the way Moab may have been. No, seriously, because Moab, they were so depressed, distressed, they had nothing. Ruth was on welfare, living off the lajis of the Hebrew farmers who left the edges of their farms on glean so people like Ruth can glean the remnants. She had no husband at the time. She had no children. Yet, Boaz saw something beyond what Ruth didn't have in the moment and saw her potential and virtuosity. And to women all over the world today, I'm saying to you, your present reality does not define your destiny. Amen. I'm saying to you, your present conditions, whether you have this or do not have that, like Ruth, who stood before Boaz, did not even know who Boaz was, what the potential Boaz had in changing her life. Destitute, desperate, a pagan, if you will. And yet, Ruth looked at her and looked through her 
and look beyond her and saw the incredible destiny that God had for her. And she, he called those things that were not as though they were. And I speak the same thing over you this morning. That everything you are looking for, all the things you are seeking, all the things you are trusting for, God, the owner of heaven and earth, will make sure he delivers those things in your life in the name of Jesus. So what did Ruth have going for her? Let's go to Ruth chapter 2, verse 12. Ruth chapter 2, verse 12. What did she have going for her that will help us? The Lord may repay your work, and a full reward be given you by the Lord God of Israel, under whose wings you have come for refuge. Now, please, can you give me that same verse in the King James Version? The same verse, Ruth 2.12. Thank you. There we go. The Lord recompense thy work, and a full reward be given thee of the Lord God of Israel, Watch this last phrase. Under whose wings thou art come to trust. That is the key. Why was Ruth a virtuous woman? Why could Boaz call her a virtuous woman when she was destitute, desperate, penniless? Why? He could do that. Because the Bible says Ruth had come to trust under the wings of God. What she had going for her was that she trusted God. Give me Psalm 36 verse 7, please. Psalm 36 verse 7 in the New King James. She trusted God. She trusted God. How excellent is that? <laughs> How precious is your loving kindness, O God. Therefore, the children of men put their trust under the shadow of your wings. Trust. Ruth trusted God. And because she trusted God, God was able to get to her the change she needed for her destiny to be what God designed it to be. Amen? Now, in, why, why would I say that Ruth trusted God? Uh, again, I don't have the time to go into all of, the, all, all of the contents of this passage. But let's go to Ruth chapter 1. Ruth chapter 1. Uh... From verse 14 through 17. Thank you. Now, the context there is Ruth and Opa were returning back to Bethlehem with Naomi. Naomi turned around and told both of them, Guys, why follow me back to Bethlehem? I'm old. I'm returning back to Bethlehem empty. I have nothing to give to you. You're, you have no husbands. Go back to your homeland. And just be there. The first said, no, 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 we're going to follow you. Okay, all right. But soon enough, Opa realized that, wait a minute now. Should I leave the familiar for the unfamiliar? And very quickly, she made up her mind and turned around and went back. From verse 14, let's pick it up from there. Then they lifted up their voices and wept again, and Opa kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. And she said, look. Your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. How do I know that Ruth trusts God? Verse 16. But Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave you or to turn back from following you. For wherever you, wherever you go, I will go. Wherever you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people. And your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. And there I will be buried. The Lord do so to me, and more also, if anything but death parts you and me. At that point, type, uh, uh, typically, Ruth became born again. I said typically. She made a commitment. I may have been a pagan, but I am going to follow you to Bethlehem where God is giving bread. And no matter what happens, you can forget it. I am following you until death do us part. She trusted God. Now, please let us really understand what is happening. This tender, vulnerable, destitute, desperate woman going to a place she's never been, 
going to a place where uh, it's, it's common and known that there were enemies to Israel. She was a foreigner, a stranger. And yes, he said, you know what? I'm going to hang on and hold on to the God of Israel. I'm going to trust God. For many of us, me inclusive, the bar that Ruth raised is too high for many of us. Let that sink in. Ruth established a trust bar that many of us will fail to attain, period. However, it's there for our instruction so we know what God is capable of doing. So I'm grateful to God that he just didn't leave it like that because Ruth's trust is a high bar for many of us. However, God gave us another man Another picture in the scriptures in Judges chapter 6, verse 12. Judges chapter 6, verse 12. Go there for me. Gideon was called a man of valor. Valor meaning, or rather valor and virtue, carries the same original Hebrew root word. So to say a man is a, is a man of valor, you are saying a man is a man of virtue. Same thing. So here in Judges 6, 12, and the angel of the Lord appeared to him, Gideon that is, and said to him, the Lord is with you, you mighty man of valor. This is where most of us are. Many of us don't meet the Ruth bar, but most of us meet the Gideon bar. Amen. Gideon was not an unbeliever. Gideon represents the Mark 24 type believer. What happened in Mark 24? Go to Mark 24 for me in the t Passion Translation. Mark 9, 24 in the Passion. Thank you. Passion Translation, Mark 9, 24. You got it. When he heard this, this is the father of the boy that Jesus was about to go heal. The boy's father cried out with tears saying, I do believe, Lord, help my little faith. Mark 9, 24 in the uh, New Kingdom says, I believe, help my unbelief. So the issue is not total unbelief. No, the issue is I believe, but right now, right now, God, my faith is weak. Right now, how many times do you and I face obstacles, face circumstances, we face situations? We believe God, we are born again, we are going to heaven. But for that situation, we say, ah, mm, I'm not quite sure. God, help me. Our faith wavers. This is the case with uh, uh, Gideon. Give me Judges chapter 6. Give it to me from verse 9. No, 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 no. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. From verse 13. From verse 13. Judges 6, 13. Thank you. So the man called him a man of valor. In other words, Gideon, the mighty brave man. Gideon said, are you kidding me? <laughs> Gideon said to him, oh my Lord. So the father that calls him Lord, in the case, is a believer. Because no one can call him Lord except by the Holy Ghost. He's a believer. If the Lord is with us, why then has all this happened to us? If God is with us, why do we go through the pandemic? If God is with us, why do I get sick every now and then? If God is with us, how come I don't get fever on my job all the time? If God is with us, why am I losing money in the stock market? If God is with us. <laughs> that, that, that may in fact be a personal testimony. I'm not sure. <laughs> oh, you, guys, you guys are dangerous people. You guys, you guys are keen to things you should not be keen into. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> Sam, is, is that you too? Yeah, don't go there. Eh? <laughs> I, I was telling a friend of mine the other day, I said, you know what? I may be going to Florida tomorrow, Lago, to kiss the ring. <laughs> So, so if you guys see me on the news going to Mar-a-Lago, you understand it? Hey, I, I've got to watch my pulse, man. <laughs> well, glory to God. If God is with us, 
where are all these miracles which our fathers told us about? So the point here is, Gideon believed, but the prevailing circumstances, the Midianites were making havoc when the Israelites planted their uh, uh, crops. The Midianites would come there, boom, took all the harvest, so much so everybody was in fear. The fear that they lived in totally completely had obliterated everything trust in God. That may be your case today. You say, God, I've waited so long. When will I find a man? If God is with me, why am I still single? Or perhaps you are married and you are trusting God for a foot of the womb and you say, if God is with me, why is it I've not had a child? If God is with me, I have a child, I'm married, but I'm not happy. Why? Why? If God is with me, why am I not being fulfilled? If God is with me, why are my children misbehaving? Why are they not lining up? Month after month, I get news of other kids graduating from college and P. Harvard, Cambridge, Oxford. My kids are only selling dime on the streets. I know you guys don't know anything about selling dimes. I pray you never know about it in Jesus' name. <laughs> I can take you some places in Atlanta, you can buy a dime right now. <laughs> so the point is, he believed God, but the prevailing circumstances around him was saying, no, 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 God is not with us. And if care is not taken, we allow the present condition to define our eternal reality. And God is saying no. No. Amen. God is not just seeing you now, he's seeing you based on the reality that he earned and paid for through Jesus Christ. So your current reality says I'm single, my husband has left me, I have no kids, my kids are living beneath my expectation. In fact, you may be on welfare. But God wants you to know this on this Mother's Day. That you are washed in his blood. Amen. And that your eternal reality is more important, more permanent, because you are robed in his righteousness. Amen. And more than everything else, you've been chosen to be his bride. So take, take comfort this morning. Gideon didn't look like he had it together. And yet God said, you are a brave man. You are a courageous man. You are a man of virtue. Your situation is not as bad as Gideon's. And so I want to encourage you this morning. No matter what's happening around us or around you, no matter the news you're hearing, keep the eternal perspective. Keep hope alive. And as you keep hope alive, you know that God is able to make all things well. And no matter what your state in life is, I'm saying to you this morning, by prophetic declaration, it shall all end in praise in Jesus' name. God will never be left or called a liar. God is not a man that he should lie. Neither the son of man that he should repent. Has he not said it, will he not bring it to pass? So your case is different. Your destiny is already set. And you will attain the fulfillment of what God has promised in the name of Jesus. Nothing is stopping you now to the glory of God. Arise, shine, and let the glory of your life be seen in the name of Jesus. So, so Father, we want to thank you for every woman, every daughter, every wife from around the globe, far and near, Lord God, in Jesus' name, that no matter what their current reality is saying to them, they will embrace your eternal reality. They will embrace the fact that they are washed in your blood, that they are robed in your righteousness, and that their future is secured, and that they have been chosen to be your bride. In the name of Jesus, we cancel out all the loud noises, all the, uh, all the lies of the enemy. We cancel them, Lord, in the name of Jesus. And we pray for all our wives, daughters, and mothers to embrace the truth of your word, which is eternal, which cannot be changed. Facts will change, but truth will stand. And so, Lord, that they will embrace the truth of your word and stand, knowing that you, who has begun a good work in them, 
you are more than able to perform and perfect everything that concerns them. Father, in Jesus' name. And so we thank you, we honor you, we bless your name now and forever in Jesus' mighty name. And again, happy Mother's Day to all of you. Amen, and God bless you.